Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to welcome you to the international webinar celebrating the 15th DS Natalis of Patimura University under the theme Honoring the Marine Environment for Preservation and Community Welfare. Today's conference organized by Faculty of Law, University of Patimura in Ambon, Indonesia. This webinar is a hybrid webinar, and to give you the best experience, the committee has provided the interpretation option at the bottom of your screen. Please click on Indonesia if you prefer Bahasa than English. Panitia telah menyediakan option interpreter atau penerjemah di bagian bawah screen Anda. Jika Anda lebih ingin menggunakan atau mendengarkan Bahasa Indonesia, silahkan klik bagian Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to introduce and welcome Patimura University's Vice Rector for Academics, Professor Dr. Freddy Lewakabesi, MPD, Deans and Vice Deans of Faculties in Patimura University, Rector of Institute Agama Islam Negeri Ambon, Rector of Institute Agama Kristen Negeri Ambon, Rector of Universitas Kristen Indonesia Ambon, Rector of Universitas Darussalam Ambon, Committee Chairman Dr. Juan Rico A.S. Titahelu, SHMH, U.S. Embassy Jakarta, Voice of America, MNC Trijaya FM, Universe Trust Law Verm, Maluku Province National Research and Innovation Agency, Legal Bureau of South Kalimantan, Legal Bureau of Sekda Kepulauan Riau, students and guests from various universities in Indonesia that have joined us today, University of Jember, Muhammadiyah Sorong, Wisnu Wardana Malang, Setia Somlaki, International University Batam, Mataram, Dr. Sutomo Surabaya, Politeknik Perikanan Negeri Tual, University of Sulawesi Barat, Puntak Surabaya, Hei Namotemo, Muhammadiyah Gresik, Dharma Persada, Institut Teknologi Aditama Surabaya, Universitas Trisakti, dan SMKN 4 Ambon. The honorable invited speakers from Rand School of Environmental Science and Management, University of California, Santa Barbara, Professor Ben Halpern, PhD, Director of Blue Park Marine Conservation Institute, Sarah Hamid, PhD, Senior Advisor in Science, Policy, and Program Development of Indonesian Conservation for the International, Dr. Victor Nikiulu, Director of Maritime and Marine Science Center of Excellence Patimura University, Dr. Rernat Gino Valentino Limon, MSE. Today's moderator, Mrs. Wilma Latuni, PhD. We welcome you all the wonderful guests and participants of today's international webinar. Before we start, let us send our praise and gratitude to God Almighty for the blessings so that we are here today on 21st April 2022, which also the date of our Kartini Day. May we always remember the importance of education and always be grateful of the freedom of rights that we have possessed today. Ladies and gentlemen, for a moment, we would like to invite you to stand up for the offline participant and sing, and sing the national anthem, Indonesia Raya. May all we rise. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Let us now begin our agenda with the welcoming speech that will be delivered by the Vice Rector of Academics of Patimura University, Professor Dr. Freddy Lewakabesi, MPD. Mr. Vice Rector, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, MC. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the International Seminar for celebrating 59th anniversary of Patimura University. It is my pleasure to welcome to warmly to this event. Thank you so much for being here in I would like to greet the Honorable Vice Rector of Patimura University, Aldin in Patimura University, the Head and Secretary of Patimura University Senate, our today, our today speakers, from Ben Happen PhD, from Brand School of Environment Science and Management, UC Santa Barbara, Mrs. Sarah Hamad PhD, as Director of Blue Park Marine Conservation Institute. Dr. Victor Nikiulu from Conservation Foundation of Chakrawala, Indonesia. Dr. Gino Limon, MSG, as Director of Maritime and Marine Science Center of Excellence, Patimura University. Our moderator, Ms. Wilma Latuni, PhD. All guests and participants today international seminar. As the vice rector for academy, let me deliver my welcome remarks on this international seminar event for celebrating the 59th anniversary of Patimura University. Assalamualaikum. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. First of all, let us express our praise and gratitude to God, to God Almighty for this abundance of grace and for on us so that this happy day we can carry out an international seminar event for the 19th anniversary of Patimura University. Ladies and gentlemen, today's seminar themes is to focus on honoring the marine environment for conservation and community welfare with its expression of the campus world in raising public awareness of sustainable marine and environment management. This is important because geographically Maluku province as small island and several large island surrounded by the sea where most of the people live the coastal area and causing coastal and marine area to be very vulnerable to various pollution threats, both organizing from human domestic activity, marine, marine debris, industry, fishing processing, sea transportation, and as an oil spill, and other activities. As we know, pollution of 
the marine environment happen while people directly or indirectly dispose something in the form of soil, liquid, or gas into marine habit with conduced effort affect us as the mate of the sustainable of marine leaf, then endangers human health and troubling the activities as at sea, including fishing. The situation will certainly harm the eco ecosystem, habitat, marine biota, and the quality, quality of the coastal environment. The threat of pollution, if not handled properly, can lead to the widespread and negative impact of human life and biota. Ladies and gentlemen, government policy number 19 of 1919 of the control of marine pollution and destruction regulate its mechanism of reduced marine pollution also the sustainable to national coordinating group to deal with marine waste. Various efforts have been made across sector and parties in prevent, prevention and control of pollution, but they were sector and, and integrated. Hopefully, through this seminar, smart and excellent recommendation what it means to that pollution control in coastal and marine area in the future will not be done partially, but involve many parties and sector, including the expert, partitioner, stakeholder, and pollution marker in change or share information data and pollution control effort that will be held in the future. Last but not least, I would like to contrat, uh, congratulate you and the implementation of this international seminar. May God get and uh, God guide as the provide the best solution for the forest mechanism mechanism on marine environment protection for the benefit of our society. That is all from me. Thank you very much for participating in this event. Finally, by saying thank you to Almighty God, I officially open this international webinar. Thank you, and I wish you all blessed day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dr. Freddy Lewakabesi, MPD. Ladies and Thank gentlemen, you. please give your best smile because we are going to have photo session. Okay. Let's start. One, two, three. Okay. Next. One, two, three. Okay. Next group. One, two, three. Yes. The last. One, two, three. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, we have come to the core agenda of our webinar is to hear the presentation from our invited speakers. The invited speakers will be divided into two panel sessions. The first panel session will be delivered by Prof. Ben Halperin, PhD, and Ms. Sarah Hamid, PhD. The second panel session by Dr. Victor Nikiulu and Dr. Rerna Ginovi Liman, MSc. Both panel sessions will be moderated by Mrs. Wilma Latuni, PhD. Allow me to read short biography of Mrs. Wilma Latuni. Mrs. Wilma Latuni's bachelor degree was from Industrial Engineering Study Program, and she held Master of Philosophy in Data Science 
from Maastricht School of Management in Netherlands, while her PhD degree in Artificial Intelligence from Tilburg University, Netherlands. She had working experience as data analyst in Dialige.com, Aachen, German, and subject matter expert in facial, facial recognition in SmartRegion.com. In 2018, she was appointed as the head of International Office of Fatimura University till today. Mrs. Wilma Latuni, PhD, the time is yours. Thank you, Master of Ceremony. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Greetings to all of you. Good morning and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the international webinar celebrating 15th anniversary of Fatimura University under the team honoring the marine environment for preservation and community welfare. First of all, my name is Wilma Latuni, who will moderate this event. Let me this morning or this evening guide the panel discussion one and two, and I will introduce four speakers. We begin with Professor Ben Halpern, PhD, from Brand School of Environmental Science and Management, University of California, Santa Barbara. Dr. Sarah Hamid, Director of Blue Park Marine Conservation Institute. Dr. Victor Nikiyulu. Dr. Victor Nikiyulu, Indonesia Conservation Foundation International, Dr. Renat Gino Limon, MC, Director of Maritime, Maritime and Marine Science Center of Excellence, Patimura University. Before I begin, I need to remind that during a presentation, the audience can ask questions in the chat box. During writing the question, please provide your name of institution and to whom you would like to ask. We will give the audience the opportunity to ask directly according to the availability of the time. We will start with the first presentation by keynote speaker one, but I will read the pres presenter a brief biography beforehand. Professor Ben Halpern, PhD, from Brand School of Environmental Science and Management, University of California, Santa Barbara. After receiving his PhD in Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology, UC Santa Barbara, he held a joint postdoctoral fellowship at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, NCEAS, and the, the Smith Fellowship Program sponsored by the Nature Conservancy. He was a research associate at NCEAS until 2013 and then appointed professor at the Brand School and served as part-time chair in marine conservation at Imperial College in London from 2013 to 2018. Dr. Halpern has been the lead scientist for the Ocean Health Index project. He also co-founded the Conservation Aquaculture Research Team, CART, and he has also conducted his a field expedition in tropical and temperate systems in the Caribbean, Red Sea, Mediterranean, Solomon Islands, Indonesia, various parts of the South Pacific, California, and Chile. Ben Harper is currently director of UCSB, National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, NCAAs in Santa Barbara. Professor Ben Halpern will present material entitled Recent Pace of Change in Cumul Cumulative Human Impacts on the World's Ocean. Professor ben, Hal ben Halpern will bring the material for 15 minutes. To Professor Halpern, time is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a great honor to be here virtually uh, and to present to you some recent research that speaks to the many ways that uh, human activities can put pressure on the world's oceans and how we can use that information to think about uh, strategic and effective ways to better manage the coastal oceans for uh, the health of oceans, but also the sustainability of the people that depend on those healthy oceans. So, as I'm sure many of you know, if not all of you, there are many ways that human activities put pressure 
on the oceans and coastal ecosystems from warming oceans that can cause coral bleaching to coastal development that can create uh, erosion, oil and gas development that can create risk of pollution to uh, trash and disease outbreaks that can close beaches and many other things, including fishing and, and um, trash. These many different stressors or pressures from our human activities affect the oceans, not individually, but collectively. So each one has its own consequence for the oceans, but together these multiple stressors can create accumulative impacts to the oceans where the sum of these pieces can be greater than, or the whole can be greater than the sum of these pieces. And so today I wanna present some work where we have taken all of this information and synthesized and mapped it to get a better understanding of where and how much different human activities are impacting the oceans. This work began over 15 years ago uh, when we first developed the approach to think about how multiple stressors affect ocean ecosystems. We published this in 2008, where we showed uh, that um, these multiple pressures from 17 or 18 different stressors associated with fishing, climate change, land-based pollution, and ocean uses like commercial shipping and oil and gas exploration were collectively having a lot of impact on the global ocean. And if we change the view of, this is that same map, but we can see that 41% of the oceans are in these orange and red colors or heavily impacted. And this was quite a, a startling result when we first discovered it you know, 15 years ago because people think the oceans are so vast that there's many places that are just untouched and therefore pristine, but that's very much not the case. In fact, a relatively small percent of the ocean is in this blue color, which is very low impact, uh, maybe something close to pristine. In fact, less than 4% of the global oceans and most of it in the polar regions is lightly impacted. And we can see two examples of this. One close to your home in Indonesia, the Torres Strait is an area that is in relatively good condition uh, compared to the rest of the world. And similarly, the Ross Sea near Antarctica is a large area. <laughs> Now, the Ross Sea is an area that is also very lightly impacted. And so we can use this information to highlight places where our cumulative effect on the oceans is large and where it is small, and think about how to use that information to design conservation strategies. It gets even more interesting when we start to track the change of this cumulative impact over time and what stressors are driving that change. So here we looked at the change five years later um, from that initial study I was just showing and looked for where places are getting worse, the yellow, orange, and red colors, and places where the cumulative pressure has decreased a little bit, which are the green and blue areas. And again, when we change the view, you see there's a lot of yellow, orange, and red colors because most of the ocean is actually getting worse. But there are some places, these green and blue areas, where it is getting better. It's about 13% of the global ocean got a little bit better during that five-year period. But it's just that five-year period. And in fact, many of those places that uh, appear to be getting better were because of temporary pause in ocean warming uh, that made it look like it was getting better, but that has since unfortunately changed. Sorry. And what we can do with this information, uh, one of many things, is to th start to think about how this change can inform strategies for conservation. 
So places that have high cumulative impact and are increasing over time, the red areas, are potentially places of greatest concern because it's lots of impact and getting worse. Whereas, for example, places in blue have low impact and are decreasing, and so maybe are places we don't yet need to prioritize, or alternatively, we might decide that these are places that we want to make sure do not see any future impact, and so we proactively set them aside into conservation. So what you do with this information depends on your objectives and your values, but it is the kind of information you need to make these strategic decisions about where and how to be most effective. And then more recently, we decided to really dive deeper into the temporal change to look at uh, the more current impact in 2013, although it's not all the way current to today, obviously, but as current as the data allowed, and to look at the change over time annually. So this is the most recent snapshot of the cumulative human impact. And we can see it changing over time, over the 11 year period from 2003 to 2013. And you can see as it gets further along in this 11 year period, the ocean gets redder and redder. And this is the accumulation of these cumulative pressures getting worse and worse over time, over a larger area of the global ocean. And again, we can look at the rate of change over this time and where it is happening the fastest. And so the areas in the dark red are where change over this time period, the 11 years, is happening the fastest. And in blue are the small areas where it's actually getting better, and the dark blue is where it's getting better the fastest. So you can start to get a sense of where this pace of change might be accelerating where it's maybe stable, and the few cases where maybe it's um, getting better. And like I showed you before, we can use this information to classify different parts of the ocean into areas over this 11 year period that have low impact and are decreasing, the blue, or have high impact and are increasing, the bright red, and then other categories that are low and fast increasing or high and decreasing. And you can imagine different strategies for each of these cases. For example, the small amount of yellow area that has low impact but is fast increasing might be places you want to act quickly to mitigate or remove the additional pressures to keep those areas protected as low impact areas or many other kinds of decisions. But again, this is the kind of information you can use to inform those strategic decisions. We use this information to also uh, unpack which stressors are having the biggest effect on which habitat types. And you can see here uh, on the top, the climate stressors of sea surface temperature or ocean warming, ocean acidification and sea level rise, those top three rows, are the ones that have a lot of yellow and red squares, which means those stressors are having high impact on many of the habitats in coastal and open ocean ecosystems. That's not surprising, uh, but understanding the relative differences in those consequences and the overall threat to marine ecosystems from climate change is a key value of the approach we've developed here. You can also see that on the right-hand side, many of the intertidal and near coastal ecosystems like mangroves or seagrass or coral reefs or salt marshes are some of the most heavily impacted ecosystems across climate change, pollution and fishing. So many, many stressors are having high impact on these habitats. And so you can use this information to think about which habitat types are uh, experiencing the greatest cumulative pressure and the greatest 
change in that cumulative pressure. So on this plot, you can see the uh, total cumulative human impact in the most recent year of our data, 2013, on the x-axis. So as you move further to the right towards three, that's higher cumulative impact. So mangrove is experiencing the highest cumulative impact of any ecosystem. And on the y-axis, it's the trend. So higher values on that y-axis mean faster increase in those cumulative impacts. So coral reefs are experiencing the fastest increase in cumulative impact. And any of the habitats that are in that upper right corner, so coral reefs, seagrass, mangroves in particular, are particularly threatened because they have high cumulative impact and high increase or trend in that cumulative impact. So this helps us start to think about which habitats, and then if you map them where, we need to be thinking about uh, swift action in order to help maintain the viability and sustainability of these habitats. I wanna show you just a few of the individual pressure layers so that you can see the kinds of information that went into calculating and mapping those cumulative human impacts. So on this slide, we can see sea surface temperature or warming oceans in the upper left, ocean acidification in the upper right, where you see the red around the poles, and then commercial shipping, where you can clearly see the global shipping routes and tracks that crisscross almost every part of the ocean, but are heavily concentrated uh, in the Northern hemisphere. These pieces tell their own story of how these individual stressors are having impact on different parts of the ocean and the ecosystems and species within them. And also how you can see the different patterns can lead to that overall cumulative impact that I was showing you before. Of course, fishing is a major source of stress and you can see in the dark blue areas uh, around many parts of the continents in the, in the world where commercial fishing that is demersal or bottom non-destructive and high bycatch, sorry for the uh, acronyms in the upper left, or for example, commercial fishing pelagic low bycatch in the lower right, have different patterns of where they're having the greatest catch and greatest impact on marine ecosystems. So these fishing layers tell us a story of how fishing is having an impact and how that will sum up to be uh, influenced the overall cumulative impact. I just want to end with uh, a few slides to lead into how this kind of information can be used to inform conservation strategies such as marine protected areas, which I know is of great interest and is being uh, used around the world already and a, a major focus of 30 by 30 efforts to protect 30% of the oceans. So marine protected areas are very good for abating certain types of stressors and are not really good for stressors that are unabatable by marine protected areas. And what I mean by abatable and unabatable is a marine protected area is designed to reduce or remove fishing in particular from an area, but it can also be used to limit or remove shipping through the boundaries of the protected area or development of oil and gas or wind energy or other offshore infrastructure. So the stressors associated with these activities are the kinds of things that can be uh, mitigated or stopped, in other words, abatable by marine protected areas. And there's others that cannot. So a marine protected area cannot stop climate change and the pressures that come from that. It cannot stop land-based pollution and the pressures that come from that, or and it cannot really stop invasive species. So these are unabatable stressors where marine protected areas can't be used to mitigate those pressures, but they can be used to build resilience to these pressures and many others. So the way that we build resilience through things like marine protected areas or really any conservation action that can reduce cumulative pressures is by removing some of these pressures. So if you imagine a place in the ocean that is being impacted by climate change, 
fishing and pollution stressors. If we put in a marine protected area, we can remove those fishing pressures and the overall cumulative impact is thus reduced. And just by doing that, of course, you are going to remove the pressure from fishing, but you're also going to reduce the overall cumulative pressure, which builds breathing space or an ability to deal with the other stressors that remain. And in doing so, this can build resilience to these other stressors that might take longer or require other conservation strategies to help marine conservation. Thank you for your time. I hope this has given some ideas about how we can think about using conservation strategies effectively and strategically to target key stressors to help build resilience in marine ecosystems and ultimately make a more sustainable and healthy nature and the communities that depend on those coastal ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Halpern, for this terrific presentation. We will meet in Q&A session. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we will listen to the second presentation by Dr. Sarah Hamid. She will provide material with the title, Effective Protection for at least 30% of the Global Oceans and Insurance Policy for Life in the Sea. But before, I will read her bio biography. Sarah Hamid, PhD from Marine Conservation Institute. Sarah earned her PhD in marine ecology with a certificate in conservation management at the University of California, Davis, where her research focused on population, connectivity along an open coast, a significant knowledge gap for marine protected area design and management. Prior to earning her doctoral degree, she earned an AB in public policy and an MA in teaching from Brown University. She served on advisory council for Corder Bank National Marine Sanctuary and is a Switzer environmental fellow. She is director of Blue Parks and senior scientist, Glenn Elaine CA. Sarah will bring the presentation for 50 minutes. 15 minutes to Dr. Hamid, time is yours. Thank you. Um, I am Sarah Hamid from Marine Conservation Institute, and I'm really happy to be talking with you today um, on Earth Day. And, uh, and I am going to focus on one of the most effective ways we can safeguard the ocean and this oceanic planet Earth that we call home. Let's see here. Uh, Professor Halpern spoke about the many ways that uh, human activities are threatening ocean ecosystems and ocean wildlife. Um, I often summarize these threats by saying that we're putting too much junk in the ocean, our garbage, our runoff, and our extra carbon, and we're pulling too much life out of the ocean. So how do we mitigate these threats and reverse some of the damage done? One of the most effective and efficient tools that we have are uh, marine protected areas or MPAs. Um, and Professor Halpern mentioned these. We know that well-managed marine protected areas in them, populations rebound and ecosystems thrive. They create safe havens for wildlife by buffering or mitigating many of the threats to marine wildlife. 
So an abundance of evidence shows that well-managed MPAs work. Uh, in one study of biological outcomes in many MPAs around the world, scientists found that on average of these uh, um, marine protected areas that, that they looked at, biomass increased by nearly 450% inside of marine protected areas. Density increased by over 150%. The size of fish increased by 28% and the number of species present increased by 21%. So pretty large um, conservation benefits to marine protected areas when they're well managed. Uh, this is going to uh, fly in the face of, of something that uh, Professor Halpern just said, but well-designed and well-managed MPAs can play a role in mitigating climate change by supporting intact ecosystems that store and sequester carbon um, and avoiding the kinds of activities like bottom trawling that would disturb the seafloor bed and might release more stores of carbon. MPAs can also support adaptation to climate change by creating stepping stones for species migrations uh, and by promoting genetic diversity within populations. MPAs can support the fisheries that feed communities all around the world. Fished populations are the ones that rebound most inside of MPAs. And the larger and more abundant fish that occur inside an MPA end up moving outside the MPA boundaries into areas where they're fished. Larvae also travel across MPA boundaries and support populations in fished areas. So with all these benefits, the international community has been convinced that MPAs are in fact valuable and countries have agreed to increase the amount of MPA coverage around the global ocean. So we've seen MPA coverage increase as more and more MPAs are designated and implemented. This chart only goes from about 1975 up through uh, 2015. So it doesn't show um, quite to the present day, but you can see that uh, the, the rate of increase in marine protected area coverage around the global ocean. So MPAs we know are great for protecting marine life. How much protection do we need? In 2016, a group of scientists collected all the studies that tried to answer this question and compared their answers. And by and large, the studies estimated that we need to protect around 30% of the ocean or more if we want to safeguard life in the sea. So once this paper was published, scientists and conservationists began advocating to protect at least 30% of the global ocean in marine protected areas. And the international community seems to be um, coming together around this idea and adopting the target of 30% uh, MPA coverage. The draft UN Convention on Biological Diversity post-2020 framework, that's a mouthful, oops, um, includes the target of protecting 30% of the ocean. But in practice, marine protected areas vary widely. Um, they vary in terms of their size and design, the types of regulations they have, their management capacity. So you can imagine that they have very different outcomes depending on those differences. In fact, most marine protected areas are not producing the conservation benefits that they promise because they're poorly designed or weakly regulated or they lack management capacity. So they don't really help towards that goal of 30% protection in the global ocean. In particular, we know that marine protected areas need strong regulations for activities like industrial fishing and oil drilling in order to see the conservation benefits like rebounding fish populations. So when we try to address this question of how much of the ocean is currently protected, um, the number is a little tricky. The official number is that marine protected areas cover just under 8% of the ocean. But that includes marine protected areas that haven't yet been implemented 
and marine protected areas that don't have strong enough regulations to produce conservation benefits. And since those MPAs with strong regulations are the ones that can produce the conservation benefits, the real coverage is less than 3%. Only those marine protected areas shown in this global map in blue. So we have an MPA quality challenge and an MPA quantity challenge in terms of getting to 30% protection for the global ocean. Here's a look at what we need to do to expand MPA coverage to achieve 30%. This map shows current MPA coverage, and this is what 30% coverage would look like. So the question is, how do we accelerate marine protected area coverage and make sure that it's effective? How do we secure those conservation benefits, climate change benefits, and fisheries benefits that MPAs can produce? While the international community is working to set that 30% marine protected area coverage target, Marine Conservation Institute has been working on another strategy to support the effort. And that's our Blue Parks Initiative. The Blue Parks Initiative accelerates the creation of effective MPAs by incentive. Blue Park awards are given to marine protected areas that meet science-based standards for conservation effectiveness and they bring international recognition and a sense of pride among communities, MPA managers, their partners, and their governments. So with this incentive, Blue Parks aligns government interests with conservation. And it addresses that dual challenge of not enough MPAs and not enough effective MPAs to conserve biodiversity in the ocean. The annual Blue Park Awards are what we like to call the Oscars of the Ocean. They're announced and celebrated at significant international meetings around the world. Uh, this year's will be coming up at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon at the end of June. And the Blue Park Award criteria are based on the science of MPA effectiveness. So they fall into six categories, location, design, governance, management, regulations, and compliance. Um, and so we evaluate each nominee for the Blue Park Award each year against uh, the criteria that fall into these six categories. And it's a, uh, a panel of international uh, marine conservation experts and scientists from around the world who ultimately determine whether or not each nominee meets these criteria. Since launching the Blue Park Awards in 2017, 21 MPAs have earned the Blue Park Awards, uh, including a Blue Park in Indonesia, Missoula Marine Reserve. Um, and two of the four nominees for the 2022 Blue Park Awards are also in Indonesia, and that's Karamunjava International uh, National Park and the Raja Ampat Islands Marine Conservation Area Network. Sorry, there, there are those two on the map. And so where we're beginning to put a little more of our effort now, in addition to these uh, Blue Park Awards for outstanding marine protected areas that meet science-based standards for conservation effectiveness, is in working with um, MPAs that are not quite meeting the Blue Park standard yet, but want to. Uh, marine protected area planners and community leaders have been reaching out to us for guidance on achieving the Blue Park status. And we're calling our collaborations with them Blue Sparks. So these are the projects that will become the next Blue Parks and will help build the network of Blue Parks to safeguard life in the sea. Hopefully building towards that 30% of the global ocean protected um, by 2030. And the Blue Parks Initiative is only one of many efforts to improve marine protected area coverage and quality. We need communities and governments around the globe to work collaboratively and quickly to protect marine ecosystems and to safeguard life on this blue planet. Um, and so that's where I'm going to end today. Happy Earth Day, and I look forward to our discussion.
Thank you, Dr. Hamid, for this valuable presentation. Dear audience, on 22nd of April, we will celebrate Earth Day. So we wish you a happy Earth Day. So next, ladies and gentlemen, we will enter the question and answer sessions, and I will read out the question that had been in the chat box interspersed with interactive session opportunities. We or we have a question from Pa Victor, but I think it has been answered by Prof Halpern, but I read again better. Hi Ben, I'm Victor Nikiolo of CI Indonesia. I'm just curious on the relation of MPA and climate change mitigation or adaptation. My experience in Raja Ampat MPAs reefs within MPAs seems to be resilient for coral bleaching than those outside MPAs. Can you say something about MPAs function in that regard? Is there similar experience in other places? Yes, uh, Prof Halpern has been answered the question, but maybe I can ask your opinion more about that question. Yeah. Yeah, happy to. So I just wrote in the comment that that's exactly the idea that I was trying to convey with the idea of reducing cumulative impact by um, reducing fishing pressure builds resilience to things like climate change because you allow the species within the reserve to recover, like Sarah's slide spoke to um, with the recovery of biodiversity and the abundance of species within the reserves, that increased abundance and diversity creates a more resilient ecosystem that can handle the pressures from things like climate change or land-based pollution. So it doesn't always work because there's some things are just, you know, too hard to recover from. Uh, the, the heat wave is just too strong and you, you can't avoid coral bleaching or the land-based pollution is just too overwhelming that you can't recover from it. But in general, healthier ecosystems are more resilient. And so that's a key strategy for using things like marine protected areas to help deal with other stressors. Thank you, Prof. Halpern. And the next question, maybe Sarah, you have read the question that, uh, thank you for making an effective MPAs in challenge for country like Indonesia with limited state budget. Do you have any idea of a sustainable financial scheme can be provided to finance MPA here in this country? Yeah. Sarah, maybe your insight? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Great. Um, this is like uh, the million dollar question is how we would say it in English, which is funny because it's about finance. Um, but this is the question that, that everyone who works on marine protected areas is constantly asking and trying to answer. Um, marine protected areas around the world are notoriously underfunded um, and have limited capacity. Um, not just in Indonesia, um, but everywhere. And so how do we uh, finance them? And so part of that, of course, is, um, you know, a political question and, and having the political will behind, um, uh, you know, the desire to, to conserve biodiversity. But there are a lot of ideas about how to come up with sustainable finance for marine protected areas and where to sort of source that money from. And uh, many marine protected areas around the world have uh, used tourism dollars, whether that's um, dive tourism or, or sort of ecotourism to help finance um, marine protected area management. That includes, you know, uh, paying fees like for a national park, your your entry fee, um, and, and that sort of thing. Of course, we found over the last couple of years, when tourism was squashed by the pandemic around the world, that all of a sudden marine protected area budgets that did rely entirely on um, on tourism dollars, their budgets disappeared, and and so. Uh, there were sort of stories of incredible hardship around trying to um, continue the work of managing a marine protected area in the pandemic without tourism. So now the question is, how do we diversify the, the budgets and the source of the budgets for marine protected areas? 
Um, one of the big uh, areas of interest right now to answer that question is in um, blue carbon finance and, and blue carbon credits. And um, I would say that I am, you know, not the expert on figuring out how that uh, may or may not work for sustainable finance in the long term for marine protected areas. But it is an area that a, a lot of us are investigating and, and trying to figure out how um, blue carbon credits in areas where there may be uh, a carbon credit system of some sort could be used to help finance marine protected areas. Um, I will also I'll end by saying so you know I don't I have a, a few different ideas basically um, but there is no silver bullet I don't think to answering this question. Um, I will say though that uh, within the Blue Parks program, we have had more nominees now from Indonesia than from any other country in the world, and so. Um, from that standpoint, I would say that there is some leadership on marine protected area effectiveness happening in Indonesia. Well, thank you, Sara, for your quick, uh, for your answer, and uh, uh, I think that I will read one question from uh, Ibu Mamesa in Indonesia. He she asked in Indonesia. Uh, to what extent the successful of MPAs could anticipate the change that has been talked by Prof. Ben? I think this is to Sarah. To what extent the successful of MPA could be to anticipate the changes that has been presented by Prof. Ben? The changes for the word of the word. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Yeah. yeah. So to what extent the successful of marine protected area to anticipate the changes uh, so by Prof. Ben. Yeah. The is the question work. about how, right, how we plan marine protected areas knowing that the global ocean is changing, yes. particularly in, in light of climate change? Yes. That is, that's a, another good question. And um, actually Professor Halpern may want to weigh in on this one as well. There is a lot of interest in thinking about, um, you know, marine protected areas that might not be uh, fixed in space, that might move as we understand how ecosystems and populations are moving and changing. Um, my, you know, background, uh, you read a little bit about my background in graduate school, uh, was in thinking about networks of marine protected areas. And so the way I think about how marine protected areas can effectively protect ocean ecosystems, even, in, you know, in a changing ocean, is, is through networks. Networks that are designed to have large enough MPAs that are spaced in such a way that they support connected populations. And they provide these kinds of stepping stones for migration um, and also uh, uh, basically build resilient um, uh, meta populations. Um, be because they're connected, uh, because they're genetically connected. So, um, I think if we are able to build out a network of global marine protected areas that do cover 30% of the global ocean, that, that will hopefully also um, be designing and thinking about this kind of uh, network approach to sizing and spacing that allows us to support you know, and adapt to climate change. Well, thank you. And I will move to the interactive sessions. There are three speak, uh, participants who would like to ask the question. And I give uh, the time to Iqbal Herwata from YKCI. Please, Pak Iqbal. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Halpern and uh, Dr. Sarah for your presentation. That's uh, really 
uh, good insight for us. Uh, I just wondering about the uh, Sarah presentation about the MPA effectiveness. Uh, they're saying only three percent, yeah, on, on all of total MPA that uh, effectively uh, manage. Uh, and and if is is there any standards to 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 assess the uh, MPA effectiveness? Because in itself we have. Uh, the criteria and the standard protocol to says how to uh, assess the effectiveness of the MPA. So how we compare each country uh, uh, steps? We don't have a standard or a, a protocol or, or a indicator to 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 achieve a, a same a status to for for the assessment. Thank you. So the question to Sarah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so this is a really good question. And the, the Blue Parks evaluation that we do for marine protected areas that are nominated is a very, very in-depth uh, evaluation. And it's not one that we have had the capacity to apply to many, many marine protected areas around the globe. We really you know, focus on those that are nominated each year. Um, but there are other frameworks for assessing and sorting marine protected areas globally um, that are being implemented. And actually, Marine Conservation Institute, my organization, also runs the Marine Protection Atlas, mpatlas.org. And that is a, um, a database of marine protected area information globally that you can sort by country as well. And what it does is it takes the official reported data about marine protected areas that's reported to the World Database on Protected Areas, the WDPA, which you can find at protectedplanet.net. Um, and, and, and then takes that information and dives a little deeper. And so right now what they're using is a new framework that was published this past year called the MPA Guide. Uh, which is a framework to sort marine protected areas on based on sort of two main attributes. The first being, what is their stage of establishment? Ha has this marine protected area only been proposed? Has it been officially designated? And then is it actually implemented? Is it being you know, enforced on the water? Does it have a management plan uh, and, and capacity behind it? So that's one axis, what, what, what stage is it at? Um, and then the second axis that it uh, uh, sorts marine protected areas on is the strength of its regulations. And so um, this part of its evaluation is similar to the evaluation that we do in Blue Parks. And it has, you know, it, it sorts uh, uh, marine protected areas into four categories, fully protected, highly protected, lightly protected, or minimally protected, depending on the impacts of the activities that occur there and which kinds of activities um, are not allowed there or don't occur there. Uh, and so that information you can find at mpatlas.org by country. Unfortunately, those uh, we've just started implementing that framework um, at, on Marine Protection Atlas. And so we don't have all marine protected areas sorted in that way just yet, but more and more will be added to the database in the coming years. Well, thank you, Sarah. And we still have uh, one opportunity to the interactive question. And I will invite Parel V. Petrus Abahari. Please, you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, thank you for Professor Ben Helpen and Dr. Sarah Hamid. Uh, my question is for Dr. Sarah. How to invite and organize fishermen to participate in protecting the MPA, especially when the MPA where, where they fishing has become a conservation area, because there is a different uh, of interest problem there. Thank you. Yes, let me ask if I understand the correct uh, the question correctly. Is the question, you know, in, in the case of wanting to create a new marine protected area, 
how you might start yeah, yeah. that process. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I have mostly learned from the history of, of the marine protected areas that I am familiar with. Um, but one of the key takeaways about marine protected areas that work is that the communities that care about these places are intimately engaged in designing them and in um, you know, creating them and in implementing them in an ongoing way. And so I think the very, you know, from the get go, the very first step is to be pulling together the, the community um, of stakeholders and folks who, who are attached and have any sort of relationship to the area um, and begin, you know, that envisioning process um, of what it is they want to see, what, what they value about the place um, and, and what their hopes and dreams for it are. Um, because it's from that vision, that community vision, um, that you ultimately are able to uh, uh, have the, the, the capacity to overcome all the challenges of creating a marine protected area. Um, and without the community and uh, community's engagement, you're going to have ongoing, you know, uh, challenges with management and with compliance. Um, if the people who are in the place and use the place don't um, believe in in the marine protected area that's created, so I think that the integral step is engaging the community and everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And I move again to the chat box. I have one question from Astuti Nurfadila. I think this is for Prof. Halpern. What are examples of innovation that can be done in overcoming marine pollution? Your yeah, that's a great question. And of course, there are many kinds of marine pollution. There's nutrient pollution from uh, land-based activities like agriculture with fertilizer runoff or chemical pollutions from industrial uses in coastal areas. There's um, trash and other marine debris. So the, the strategies really depend on the type of pollution and each has its own consequence for coastal marine ecosystems. So I would say <clears throat> there are a lot of innovations about um, ways to reduce fertilizer input on agricultural lands that can help reduce runoff. This is sort of a uh, not only a technological innovation, but just a, a, a practice of how farmers use fertilizers. You can um, restore coastal habitats to create what they call green infrastructure that lets nature filter out nutrients and other pollutants um, just by the plants, the salt marshes growing. Um, and you can have Rules and regulations, for example, there already exist for um, the dumping of waste from ships as they uh, and their ballast water that both um, can create pollution or invasive species that with those rules and regulations can limit the exposure of coastal marine ecosystems to those pollutants. And then there's, of course, challenges in enforcing that. But there are quite a lot of, there's some technological innovations but honestly, most of it comes to um, policy and behavioral shifts that can be incentivized either through markets or policy to, to have people do better practices that just reduce pressure from pollution on the ecosystems. Thank you for Halpern. And I move again to interactive session to Mrs. Siska Sukamena. Please, time is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Mrs. Latini. I'm very grateful for the chance. I have a uh, question for Professor Ben Halpern and also for Ms. Sarahabit. I hope uh, you don't mind. Uh, for Professor Ben Halpern, uh, I'm a student currently majoring in law, so my knowledge about this type of thing is very surface level. I hope you don't mind. Um, you see, when you were presenting your data from around 2008 to 2015, uh, there was a data that stated that 13% was getting better. 
and it was due because of a temporary pause. Uh, could you please elaborate more on that? How can this uh, temporary pause happen? Does it happen accidentally or is it naturally? And can we use it to like, can we take advantage of it to kickstart our attempt or to save the earth? Uh, that's for Professor Ben Halpern. Uh, I hope you can answer that first before I move to Mr. Hamid. Thank you. Yeah, uh, great question. And so climate change has uh, obviously a, a trajectory of overall warming on average over the last few decades. And we see that very clearly, but it has different spatial patterns in different parts of the ocean. So some places are warming very fast and some places are warming slowly. And some places are actually getting a little bit cooler uh, temporarily. And so you see this spatial pattern uh, changing over time. And that pause was just a case of a five or 10 year period where there were places where the oceans, small area, well, areas that were getting a little bit cooler just because of the way uh, climate change happens on, on the planet. And so now those places, unfortunately, are mostly gone and they have warmed up. Uh, and so it's just the natural pattern of how climate change is occurring in our oceans that creates these patterns that we see of fast warming, slower warming, and occasional cooling down. I'm not sure how we could use that to um, like take advantage of that, uh, just because it is, in general, not lasting. It's for a, a, you know, a short period of time. And so maybe there are ways to find those places and act uh, for other kinds of conservation to um, like putting in a protected area where the recovery of the species within that might take, you know, five or 10 years to fully recover. That would allow time for that recovery to happen while climate change is not as strong in those places so that when climate change starts to ramp up uh, in those places, you've built up the resilience of this, the ecosystems and the species in that place. That's maybe one way you could take advantage of that. Um, but unfortunately, it's, it's not a long lived phenomenon. So it's, uh, you, you have a short window of time to do something with it. Thank you, Prof. Halper. There is one question in Indonesian language from Violeta Soplantila, and we try to translate it in English. Indonesia is a maritime country, and most of the citizen economic activities based on the ocean. Indonesia ecosystem is rich, and the potency of support their economy is high. But do those sea catch could make them prosperous? I think this question delivered to both of you. I start with Prof. Halpern, maybe. I, I'm, I think I need to understand the question. I'm sorry. Can you okay. try one more time? Uh, Indonesia is a maritime country, and most of the citizen economic activities based on the ocean. Indonesia ecosystem is rich, and the potency of support their economy is high. But do those sea catch could make them prosperous. But does the sea catch make them prosperous? I, yes. I think if I understand the question right is, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people, most people in Indonesia that are connected to the oceans through their livelihoods and economies and the very rich ocean provides a lot to them. And how do we balance that with the need for conservation and protection of coastal oceans? Is that the question? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. Of course, the pressures we put on the ocean come from the fact that we are doing activities that bring us benefit. They feed us, they provide us livelihoods. There's a lot of other um, tourism, trade. All of these things provide benefit to local people, but of course, put pressure on the oceans. And I think that the balance is to find ways to protect enough of the ocean to make sure that it is sustainable and healthy to continue to provide those benefits into the future. So the idea behind 30 by 30 is that that is maybe the minimum amount of ocean to set aside in a protected status 
to allow nature to thrive, or at least be fully sustainable, to ensure that it can be around to provide the food and the tourism and the other benefits that people need from the oceans. We've seen too many times around the world that we can love the oceans to death. If we put too much pressure on them, they will collapse and then we have no more benefits. You have no more food, you have no more tourism because it is fully degraded. And so there is huge incentive to build a sustainable, healthy ocean, not just for nature, but for people too. And I think finding that balance is what we see in what um, Sarah's talk presented in the initiatives there and what so many people around the world are trying to do is let's make sure that nature can survive and thrive so that people can survive and thrive. Thank you, Prof. Halpern. And probably Dr. Hami, you'd like to add more? I think Professor Halpern had the, the perfect answer. I, I don't have anything to add. I would have said the exact same thing. <laughs> Fine, thank you. And for Mrs. Siska, please hold for for a moment, and we will read the question from Haiti Siwabesi first. How does the government in U.S. implement the UN law of the sea to overcome human activities that harm sea environment? And how successful it is? Could Indonesia as maritime country implement the same thing? I think this question also to both of you. Who would like to start to answer? Or to give your opinion, oh, Prof. Ben Alpern, please. Happy to let Sarah go first. Yeah, given her background in policy, maybe she knows more than I do. Oh, my background in policy. <laughs> but, uh, so I think I understand the question really about the how, how you know, a comparison with how um, marine protected areas have been implemented in the US. Is that, I guess we don't have the. Um, questioner here to ask if I'm understanding correctly. Um, and, and if that is the question, I would say that the United States track record on marine protected areas is uneven. Um, we have some very uh, strong and very successful marine protected areas in the United States. Um, and we also have marine protected areas that are very weakly regulated and that allow for a lot of impactful, destructive uh, human activities. So, um, so we have, there, there, <laughs> I would say that, you know, we don't have um, the perfect model. In fact, we've just, uh, we're working on a report right now, but we've written similar reports that show that the, and this is true of a lot of um, sort of, uh, colonial um, uh, governments is that they have predominantly protected areas really well in um, their colonial territories or you know what colonial territories they may still have areas that are um, you know offshore from their mainland uh, and that is true of the US so the US is best protected uh, largest marine protected areas, are Papahanaumokua Marine National Monument that's in the Pacific um, in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and, um, and coming up close behind it, the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. Um, our national marine sanctuaries tend to be much that, that are you know, closer to, um, to mainland US tend to be much less well regulated, lightly or minimally regulated based on the MPA guide assessments. Um, now, within states um, in the U.S., there are, you know, each state in the U.S. has its own, each coastal state in the U.S. has its own state waters um, within sort of the, the national waters. And so states are able to create their own marine protected areas um, within their own waters. And some states have created uh, quite a number of very strong marine protected areas. California is one of those states. And so both Dr. Halpern and I, uh, sorry, Professor Halpern and I are in the state of California, which went through a process over the last couple of decades to create a network of 124 marine protected areas along the coast of California. Um, 
not quite getting to 30% of state waters, but getting pretty close to 30% of the state waters protected um, in those marine protected areas. And so that's an example of a, of a really, a really strong example, probably the only really, really strong example in state waters in the US. Um, so I've rambled a little bit, I'm sorry. I hope that I sort of addressed the question. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Dear participants, I think there are three questions, two questions on chat box and one for interactive session. So I limit this question for last three questions. So I will read two questions from chat box first. From... From Junior Lumintang, thanks for the opportunity. I have a question for Prof. Ben and Dr. Sara. I need your opinion about Indonesia that joined G20 that have a concern to save the environment. I believe that this is the big opportunity for Indonesia for giving the contribution. My question is what should the Molokan citizen have to do to improve people awareness about how to keep the environment, especially for the marine environment. Who would like to answer first, Prof. Ben or Dr. Sam? Sure, I'll, I'll try. It's a yes. uh, definitely a question outside my area of expertise. So uh, this is an opinion at best, but um, obviously uh, countries uh, participating at the international level through things like the G20 are a great way to um, build coalitions that can help implement international policy around setting targets, for example, of what we want to do around marine conservation. But of course, the actual action for the most part happens within a country. And so what Indonesia can do for Indonesia is primarily within the country. And so I think the idea of helping um, improve citizen awareness about the marine environment is exactly the right strategy. I think people um, may not know the extent to which the oceans are changing or are being impacted. Certainly many do for their own local reef or their own local coast, but they may not realize that it's all of Indonesia or all of the world. And so helping raise awareness about um, the condition of the oceans and the need for action that protects their own resources as well as the national resources of Indonesia is, I think, really powerful. And so talking about it, helping people learn and understand is a really powerful way of building citizen awareness and, and helping take action. And Dr. Hamid, would like to add more? I definitely agree with where Professor Halpern ended up. I think that, that um, and this, this goes back to my thinking about how you um, start a new marine protected area and it's through that kind of community engagement and community action and community education uh, that that happens. Thank you. And the last question on the chat box from Iqbal Herwata to Dr. Sara, what are the key features or criteria to consider in designing a deep sea MPA to protect migratory or seasonal species. Is there a case study for this, which will, which will be adopted in Indonesia? And how did this design prove to be effective? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think I'd start with the idea that a marine protected area is, um, you know, aims to protect a whole ecosystem. And so while there may be a flagship species or a species of conservation concern that, um, you know, galvanizes interest in a marine protected area, um, supporting a, a particular species is going to necessarily mean protecting its habitat, the habitat that it's using um, there. And so it depends on what that habitat looks like. It can be helpful to have um, information, you know, uh, uh, data tracking or ecological information, biological information um, and tracking data 
of those um, animals of interest, of conservation interest, to figure out how they're using the habitat, what that habitat looks like. Um, in terms of, of designing a marine protected area. And, and an example of that, a recent example of that that I can think of is a campaign to protect a swimway um, that uh, is actually requires a, um, an international collaboration. And that's a, a swimway for um, pelagic species, particularly sharks and rays and turtles between uh, Galapagos Marine Reserve in Ecuador and Cocos Island National Park in Costa Rica. Um, and so a, a group of scientists, a group of organizations, Migramar has been um, collecting, you know, data on, on these types of migrations that happen in this Eastern tropical Pacific region of the ocean um, for years and years and have, have put forward uh, a proposal and have really gotten a lot of support and um, recently gotten promises and proposals from the governments of Ecuador and Costa Rica to create uh, marine protected areas that will extend um, you know, across this swimway um, and meet at their uh, exclusive economic zones. Uh, that's still in process, but uh, I know that um, on the Ecuador side, uh, uh, the new marine protected area called Armandad Marine Reserve, which covers the uh, Ecuadorian side of that um, swimway was, was just recently designated earlier this year. So that's an example of that happening. Uh, it does require, you know, gathering some information um, about, as I said, about how that species uses that habitat. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. And we are now to the last question from Siska Sopamena. She will ask interactive. Please, Ms. Iska. Uh, thank you so much, Mrs. Latuni. I appreciate uh, the chance again. Uh, this time, I have a question for Dr. Sarah Hamid. I apologize, I didn't address you as such from previously. Um, you see, Dr. Dr. Hamid, I am I'm a I'm a Gen Z. I basically live on the internet, and I see so many people basically going green, they live sustainably. And it's amazing, it makes me want to help the earth. But here's the thing, going green is a privilege. Uh, not everyone can afford going green, especially, you know, most of us, uh, middle-class families in a third world country such as Indonesia. So it has me thinking, instead of having the people being the ones to start being environmentally friendly, see the ocean, why couldn't we start with the companies that keeps on providing us with this plastic waste? Uh, you see, why not fight to change the system that these big companies have? Why not start from changing their policies, you know, their policy making uh, decisions? Why don't we request for a better regulation and stricter uh, enforcement? Why couldn't we do that? Uh, that's my question for Dr. Sarahami. Thank you so much. Well, I, I think you're right that, um, you know, the people who uh, don't have a lot of means are not the ones who are contributing most to our climate change issues and to our plastic pollution issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that change does need to come um, from corporations. It also needs to come from governments regulating corporations. I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced corporations are gonna do it on their own. Um, so, uh, but I do think that we can all play a role in trying to make those demands of our governments and the corporations um, that we do have any engagement with. Um, and, and I think, you know, those of us who have, uh, whatever voice we have, we need to use it um, to leverage those, those governments and, and those corporations to do better. Um, so that's what I would say, uh, in the in the big picture, I do I do come back to at the end of the day things that we can do um, as individuals in communities who care about the ocean um, and care about these places that we are connected to and that we depend on. Um, we really can you know start um, local protections for our local environment by getting together with our communities. 
Um, so I also find for myself um, a sense of hope and strength in getting together with my community um, to, to, do, to be involved in local action. Thank you, Sarah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have reached the time allocated for this panel one. And before I end it, let us express our gratitude to the keynote speaker, Professor Ben Harper, PhD from Brand School of Environmental Science and Management University of California, Santa Barbara, Dr. Sarah Hamid, Director of Blue Park Marine Conservation Institute for the time and material that is precious to us in this day. Hopefully the material presented can be a reference for researchers and students related to important issue that exists in the realm of scientific development in the Patimura University. As our appreciation for the keynote speaker, we present the following certificate. I will share the certificate and send the copy to both of you. Yes, this certificate is given to Professor Ben Harper, PhD, as the speaker in the international webinar. The 15th is Natalis Patimura University, Ambon, Maluku. And the next certificate is, the, is given to Sarah Hami, PhD, as the speaker in the international <laughs> webinar. In the 15th DS Natalis Patimura University, Ambon, Maluku, Indonesia. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, You're wonderful. Welcome. <laughs> Once again, thank you. And we give a round big applause to the speaker on this panel. We wish you both a very nice evening. And see you again on another event. If you thank would you. like to leave the session, Italy. Thank you very much. And before we, we, we move to the second session, we are thanking to US Embassy Indonesia, who is providing and support us to give two speakers from United States of America and to provide also interpreter for this webinar event. Thank you very much to US Embassy. Dear audience, we will move to the second panel session. And I would like to invite Dr. Victor Nikiulu and Dr. Renat Gino Limon. We will have two presentations in this, in this session. And it will be started with presentation by Dr. Victor Nikiulu with the title, Using Blue Halo Approach to Admire the Sea and Prosper the People of Maluku. But before, I will read his brief biography. Dr. Victor Nikiulu was the former Director General of Peace Processing and Marketing of the Indonesia Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fishery, MMAF, and the Executive Secretary of the National Coordinating Committee of the CTICFF. He initiated the formation of 11 fisheries management area FMS that are now implemented in Indonesia when he was the director of Research Center of Capture Fisheries, RCF, RCCF. He received his PhD in resource economics from the University of the Philippines in Los Banos, UPLD in 1994, where he was awarded the best PhD dissertation in the School of Economics and Management. Dr. Nikiulu has authored 11 books on fisheries management that are widely used in the fisheries schools and academies in Indonesia. Dr. Nikiulu will bring the presentation for 15 minutes. To Dr. Nikiulu, time is yours. I will help, I will ask. 
I will ask the admin to help me in presenting my, my presentation materials. Yeah, thank you for having me in this uh, prestigious event. Uh, this presentation was prepared by uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Park Rector Sapteno, Prof. Sapteno uh, and me. And uh, it is uh, entitled Using Blue Halo Approach to Admire the Sea and uh, Pursue the Prosperity of the uh, People of, of Maluku. So you see that uh, just from the title, you will see that there are three key words. One is the how uh, we admire the sea. The second one, uh, we use the sea or utilize the sea uh, to gain uh, prosperity uh, for the local people. And the third one is the uh, blue halo approach. I will use uh, 15 minutes. I will manage 15 minutes to uh, present uh, our, our presentation. Next, please. OK, uh, the first uh, question is how uh, we admire the sea. Is very important one, and I think it is like a foundation or the basis uh, for us, uh, we as human being, uh, to uh, pay uh, attention, uh, have an honor and respect uh, on the sea, uh, and uh, you know uh, it comes from the very basic premise that the sea is one of the important creation, and sea is our source of life. And we human beings are mandated uh, to manage uh, the sea. Uh, especially for us in Maluku, uh, sea is extremely important and significant. Maluku is bordered by three, uh, we call it WPP or fisheries management area. And the WPP contributed about, about 60% of Indonesian cats. In terms of value, it must higher uh, because uh, uh, most of the fish uh, resulted from uh, uh, waters in Maluku are a uh, highly economic important species. Uh, things like like uh, tuna, like like udang, skipjack, or stream, are uh, resulted mostly from uh, the waters uh, border my Maluku provinces. Uh, another things, um, Maluku is one of the nine uh, uh, we call it island provinces or archipelago provinces. And people in Maluku living and beat by the sea. And sea is basically, uh, or engagement with the sea is basically one of the way of life. In Maluku right now, we have uh, uh, like 300,000 uh, visitors or fishermen family out of the close to 2,000 people or population in Maluku. Uh, well, um, managing or uh, uh, admiring the sea is basically a call for all of us. If you read our holy, holy book, uh, holy Bible in the first sentence of the book, uh, it says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, a spirit of God uh, moved on the face of the water. So basically the earth at the beginning of the day, uh, 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 the earth is overwhelmed by the water. And uh, this is, that is basically, uh, I mentioned before, like foundation or a basic premise for human being to respect the sea. And if you read uh, Genesis 1.28 uh, in the various, uh, um, uh, various, various um, uh, version of the Bible, and you will find out that, uh, you know, um, basically we are us, we are called to manage the sea in our uh, common uh, current uh, modern language. Have dominion over the fish of the sea. That's according to a King James Version, authorized King James Version. Rule over the, the, the fish in the sea, NIV Version. Take charge of the fish of the sea, CAB, and be master of the fish in the ocean. It is according to uh, ISF. In other words, if you say that you love the sea, you respect the sea, and that should be followed up by, by real action. You can act without love, but you cannot love without action. That's very important thing. And basically, that is the basis. So in order to sustain the sea, then, uh, then you, can, you should have a real action to protect, to preserve, to maintain, to well treat and conserve, and live together, even live together with the sea. That's basically 
the meaning of admiring, honoring, respecting, or even glorifying the sea. That's uh, if we are talking about how to honor the sea, and we still have in mind that uh, action is very, very important. And our action is basically uh, have, a, have a basic premise, uh, what we believe, what we, what, we, what we trust, that sea is one of the creation. Similarly with us, we are also one of the creation. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, what happened with us uh, uh, right now in, in Indonesia as a whole, but particularly in Maluku, can be seen from this slide. This slide is basically want to show that we have mismanaged our water. We have mismanaged our resources. And the data, the upper data is uh, five years ago. In, in, the, in the upper screen is five years ago. And the lower screen is uh, uh, just recently published by the, by the government, by the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. So we are here in, in Maluku. We have, uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, three uh, fishing ground. We call it WPP or Fisheries Management Area, Banda, Seram, and Arapura. And in each uh, fishing ground, we have nine fisheries. So overall, we have 27 fisheries in this province or uh, owned by these provinces or should be managed by these provinces. And if you look at the table, upper table, uh, 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 in 2017 or five years ago, of the 27, 27 uh, fisheries uh, uh, occur or, or found in, in this province, there are only four fisheries which are underexploited. Uh, about 15 fisheries have been fully exploited, and uh, eight fisheries have been overexploited. But if you compare, sadly, you can compare it with the 2022 uh, data, and you you can see, you can notice in the in the screen that uh, after five years, there is no fisheries in this region which are underexploited. All fisheries, 27 fisheries in this region have been either fully exploited or uh, overexploited. That indicates that uh, we, are not, we, are, we, we do not respect the sea. We are not honoring the sea as, uh, we, as we should, as we are called, to, uh, as we are mandated to honor and glorify the sea. Uh, can be shown by, by our practices in a way uh, all fisheries in this region, uh, you know, this is basically our responsibility, but uh, the responsibility can be at the hand of the, of the higher level. Uh, we are all called to manage our resources, but in fact, uh, in the last 15 days, uh, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's going to be uh, dwindling. Uh, the condition is, is, uh, is uh, worse uh, compared with the, with the previous uh, last last five, previous five years. Okay, next please. Uh, you know, in other things, I, I think this is like a second 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 uh, keywords of of my our our presentation is about the prosperity. But uh, you know, in the other side, you can call it uh, uh, not prosperity but poverty indicator. And I try to put some data here in the slide. Uh, you can see in the screen that. Uh, there are several data showing, showing uh, the province Maluku status compared to the rest of Indonesia. And just from the Human Development Index, uh, HDI or Human Development Index is the composite index uh, that, uh, that embrace uh, education, health, and income. And you can see that compared to other part of Indonesia or Indonesian Affairs, our Human Development, our human development, development Index is below, below the national average. That indicate uh, our status or our position uh, compared to other provinces or other regions in Indonesia. And if you are looking at the uh, at the other uh, indicator like average school life age uh, beyond than five years, fifteen years, Maluku in Indonesia, the unmet need of health services, meaning that uh, services uh, health services that can be cannot be uh, cannot be proceed cannot be cannot be cannot be attained. And then if you look at the poverty incidence or poverty index, if you look at the special index on a stunting management, and lastly, if you look at the illiteracy uh, rate, 
and you will come up with a conclusion that uh, Maluku, Maluku, if not in the middle, it will be in the bottom of the list uh, in terms of prosperity. Uh, or in other words, you say in terms of poverty, we are still we are we are in the in the in the uh, uh, lower condition compared to other part of Indonesia. Next slide, please. So given that we have a we have a problem in uh, managing our fisheries, looking from the fact that uh, in the last five years our resource status is uh, even worse. Then, and the fact that uh, uh, this uh, province, people of the, this province or population of the province in the condition where, where uh, you know, slightly lower than, than other part of Indonesia, then given that government have uh, 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 implemented uh, uh, programs, project uh, to improve fisheries uh, at the national level, but more particularly in this region, then uh, we are coming up with, the, with, this, with this idea. Uh, you know, uh, my organization, Conservasi Indonesia, is working with the uh, with, uh, with, uh, central government institution at GNC, and we try to, and even with the University of Patimura, and we try to uh, introduce a blue halo concept. So blue halo is basically uh, like a, an integrated uh, management approach where MPA, the MPA topic, uh, are covered by, by Sarah and Ben in the morning session, uh, where MPA or Marine Protected Area are all togetherly managed with, with uh, a fish stock, commercial fish stock, in a way that uh, MPA uh, condition is, is good, is getting better, but at the same time, uh, uh, fishery stock is well managed, and as a result, uh, the, the prosperity or the income that can be derived by fishermen can be guaranteed. Basically, uh, that's uh, 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 the integrated approach that we call a blue halo, and blue halo has been used in, in other parts of the world, and we are trying to uh, modify blue halo and, and uh, introduce it here in, in, in Indonesia that will be started in uh, uh, fishing ground or fisheries management area bordering uh, Maluku provinces. Thanks, please. So, uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, this is uh, like a thematic uh, presentation of the of the of the blue halo. We we have a uh, um, like uh, two cycle two cycles in the blue halo: the biological cycles and the economic cycles, and how those two cycles are joined together, are merged in a way that uh, uh, management can be can be improved and uh, uh, fish still be there uh, in, in the sea, and uh, the fish can be used, utilized by the people, especially the local people, and as a result, uh, uh, um, uh, livelihood of the people uh, can, be, can be improved. Basically, uh, this slide uh, summarizes uh, the all component of the blue halo, and uh, it is uh, a, a science-based approach, starting with the science component, and the follow up by by implementation uh, policy component and lastly a social economic component next please so uh, we are trying we are working with the uh, with the uh, with the central government uh, right now to introduce a uh, blue halo in the uh, uh, waters or a fishing ground or fish stock in maluku or uh, owned or bordered by maluku provinces and it is uh, in uh, Bandasi, we call it 714. In the Arafura Sea, call 718. And in the, in the Seram Sea, call 715. So overall, the area cover like almost 100 million hectare. And out of the 100 million hectare, we have 13.7 million hectare of MPA. The MPA we talked before this morning, uh, presented by Sarah and, and uh, Ben Harpen. So um, this is basically a good idea. Sarah mentioned about 30% uh, of the area should be protected. But what we have here in, in this province is uh, more than, uh, it's like 14%. Uh, it's not yet 30%, but it is the highest uh, percentage of MBA in the country compared to other parts of the country, what you find in, in, in Maluku in uh, provinces bordering uh, those three MPA or waters are basically higher in terms of percentage. There are more MPA, marine protected area, found in this area compared to the other part of the country. 
So uh, we are starting with this with this idea how uh, the blue halo can be applied in these uh, provinces in this region that will cover uh, huge uh, area you know huge huge uh, fisheries. I mentioned before it will come up like 60 percent of the total uh, fishery stock owned by this country. Next, please. Okay, uh, I mentioned before about the blue halo objective. So it is basically uh, biological, uh, biological connectivity, but it's also social uh, connectivity, and uh, ending up with the with the economic uh, impact. So uh, overarching objective of this uh, project of this approach uh, basically is to establish creative and sustainable financing mechanism in a way that. Uh, fish resources and conservation area can be all togetherly managed uh, uh, in sustainable, sustainable manner to come up with a positive result. And we have like a specific objective, one, two, three, seven objective over here. Uh, there's uh, objective under the uh, biological uh, component. There is under uh, social component, uh, MPA. If you look at the screen and you will see that uh, MPA is one of the objective, finance and build capacity to improve marine protected area or uh, management and new MPA development. So creating new MPA also is one of the objective. Uh, synergize MPA in the, in the, in the fishing uh, practices, stimulate local employment and livelihood, and lastly, deliver reasonable return for equity, bondholder to blended finance. Basically, that's the, the, the specific objective. But the main objective or overarching of the ultimate objective is to create a sustainability biologically, uh, financially, and economically. Next, please. Blue halo component, there are four, four, four items uh, considered as blue halo component. Science, policy, capacity building. So we are working on science. And even tomorrow, uh, University of Patimura survey team uh, uh, will, will launch uh, a survey, you know, in order to understand the connectivity between uh, uh, of the blue halo, that's between uh, fishing ground or, or commercial fish stock uh, uh, and the MPA, then we started it tomorrow. They'll be launched tomorrow, a survey for about a month uh, in 714 uh, area Bandasi and 715 area uh, Seramsi. So we have science component, uh, we have a bioeconomic modeling component, and the bioeconomic mod modeling component is basically is uh, undertaken uh, will be undertaken by University of Santa Barbara, UC uh, SB, uh, the place where uh, Professor Ben Harpen uh, is is working right now. So we will we will we will have bioeconomic modeling and hopefully within one two years we'll come up with a with a with the result that will be uh, uh, guiding guiding uh, the the management uh, process of the fisheries in this country, especially in this region. And the correlation of the blue carbon, I think uh, Sarah also mentioned about the blue, blue carbon. Uh, we also will have a science component in that aspect. And we have a policy aspect, national policy, subnational uh, government, uh, uh, provincial government level policy, even, even uh, uh, regential or district or kabupaten level policy. But at the same time, we will work on the policy in a way that uh, traditional and customary practice will be will be upheld, will be will be strengthened, will be promoted. That basically, a policy not only not only dealing with with the, with the formal formal regulation, rule and regulation, but also uh, traditional regulation like uh, what we have in in, in Maluku and uh, you know uh, other provinces uh, close to Maluku like Papua and. East Nusa Tenggara. And the third component is capacity building. Uh, there will be component of training and education. Very soon we are here in the University of Patimura. We'll design, uh, we call it Blue Halo 101. It's basically a basic course of Blue Halo that we will try to introduce or we'll, we'll try to develop here in, in University of Patimura. And hopefully later uh, the, the, the Blue Halo 101 can be adapted as a uh, you know, part of the curriculum here in, in, in the university. So there's a training and education uh, component, uh, improving capacity training on government official to increase or improve their capacity in, in the management. And of course, a uh, very important aspect uh, that will be deal with the gender inclusive and, uh, you know, culturally response, 
responsive capacity building. So there's also training on, on the women and girls in a way that they have uh, improved capacity to, to manage the fisheries, but at the same time to develop um, uh, post-harvest marketing uh, related activity, uh, fisheries related activity. The last component of the blue halo is sustainable financing or sustainable livelihood. So we will work in a way that uh, uh, sustainable financing will be in place. We will design, we will design um, uh, like a, a, a financing mechanism uh, using the, the the current approach, the innovative, innovative approach, working with the uh, you know uh, inclusive, not inclusive, but exclusively, inclusively with many 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 agents and the many people to develop to develop uh, sustainable financing. And of course, we hope that uh, by capacity development at the local level, sustainable livelihood can also be, be in place. That basically four component of the, of the blue halo. Next slide, please. And the expected impact. So uh, if you look at the screen, uh, there is a, a, you know, at the, at the right hand side, it's basically the impact that, that we have tried to estimate uh, that the impact will come up with the with the uh, biological value yeah it will it will uh, impact in terms of uh, uh, ecological or biological impact and the income the impact uh, on the aspect of uh, dollar or rupiah and the impact uh, social impact uh, uh, yeah, especially in the aspect of uh, uh, you know million of people or numbers of people involved in the in this process so uh, we hope that will be more sustainable marine uh, fishery stock. We hope that uh, what we have experienced in the last five years can be improved. Uh, the things of, about the, the fishery stock that I, I, I presented before in the table, we hope that can be improved by having by 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 uh, implementing blue halo concept. Uh, and we hope also uh, uh, we have estimated that there are about 250 trillion rupiah per year that can be that can be derived. Uh, from from this project, and of course, uh, it is it is a, a big pie, and the pie should be divided to a different sector, different people, and of course, including also the small scale uh, fishermen, uh, small scale fishing community community in this region. And then lastly, about the numbers of people involved, we hope that uh, 1.5 about 1.5 million new fishing sector and tourism job can be can be created by applying this, this concept. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's basically the end of my, my presentation or my, my slide. I just want to conclude that uh, given that we are facing a problem right now, problem of resource management and problem of uh, poverty. Yeah, we are, it seems that we are now in a stalemate of how to improve uh, people well-being and have a healthy fish stock. So we are offering uh, an integrated management approach called Blue Halo, by which biological and economic aspects are merged, are integrated. We hope that by the approach, we could regain a better managed fisheries resources and could provide better social economic condition for the people in, in Maluku. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rikilu, for this terrific presentation. We then move to the sec second speaker on this panel session. Dr. Renat Gino Limon. He will bring the talk titled Monetizing Marine Biodiversity for the Welfare of Coastal Community. But before I will read his short bio. Dr. Renat Gino V. Limon from Patimura University. He achieved his bachelor's in biology from Hasanuddin University in Indonesia before continuing his master's in marine biology geology at McMaster University, Canada. He completed his PhD in molecular biology from the Friedrich Schiller University, Hans Knoll Institute in Germany. He has over 15 years of experience in molecular biology and is an expert in marine biotechnology. Dr. Limon was working as a visiting fellow at National Institute of Environmental Science, NIH, USA. Then he was invited to work in Singapore as a senior research scientist for the Singapore MIT Alliance 
for Research and Technology Smart. Today, Dr. Limon has been appointed as Chairman of Marine Research Center of Excellence, Patimura University. Dr. Renat Dino Limon will bring his presentation for 15 minutes. To Dr. Limon, time is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, allow me to share the slides. Can everybody see the slide? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, previous speakers have talked about how we have to conserve our marine environment. Uh, I will then talk how can we utilize our marine resources, but in sustainable way. The title is Monetizing Marine Biodiversity for the Welfare of Coastal Communities in Maluku. There's a little bit change because I'm adding Maluku in it. So basically, how can we use the biodiversity to, or we utilize biodiversity to increase the welfare of uh, Maluku people, to increase the economy and release this province from poverty. poverty. So historically, many scientists of naturalists have visited Maluku due to spices or due to the biodiversity in Maluku. For example, Rumphius come in 16th century as a part of a Dutch company. And uh, he collect and describe many, many plants and marine organisms. The collection of his writing was published later. The title is the Herbarium Ambonense, and it consists of six volumes. Five volume is a description of plant and one volume description of marine organism. Another famous scientist or naturalist that come to Maluku is Alfred Russell Wallace who came in 18th centuries and stay for a while in Ternate. Alfred Russell Wallace have been all around the world, but when he came to Ambon, he wrote that he never saw a coral reef as healthy and as beautiful as coral reef in Ambon Bay, Ambon Harbor. We can only speculate that Ambon Harbor must be in Ambon Bay. Too bad, nowadays we see that coral reef in Ambon Bay has degraded so much and almost all destroyed. However, uh, several years ago, six countries initiate so-called Coral Reef Triangle. Coral Reef Triangle initiative based on the consideration that we need to protect this area, which is very high biodiversity. Some of the country have part of the country included in the Coral Reef Triangle, but Indonesia have you seen, as you've seen in this, in this map, almost the whole country was included in Coral Reef Triangle. And this area have a very high biodiversity. And if you look very carefully, Maluku located in the heart of Coral Reef Triangle. The proof of the high diversity can be seen in this heat map. This is shown the species of coral in Coral Reef Triangle. 
The heat map show that the darker the color is, the more species we have. As you've seen, here is the area where the highest species of coral. And again, Maluku is in the middle of it, and uh, Indonesia in the middle of it, and Maluku is in the heart of it. Another proof is the species uh, diversity of fish species in coral reef triangle. Again, we can see that coral uh, fish species in Indonesia is very high, and again, Maluku is in the middle of, in the heart of this mega biodiversity. So, to whom who is not uh, really familiar with Maluku area, the green area here is the Maluku province. There are 1,340 islands, and the whole area is 92% consists of ocean, and only 7.6% consists of land. If you connect the shoreline of this small island, it becomes 10, around 10,000 kilometer, which is around 13% of the whole Indonesian shoreline. It's a huge shoreline or very long shoreline. We have two very famous sea, Banda Sea, which is one of the deepest sea in the, in the world, 7.5 kilometer at the deepest. And interestingly, it located in the territory of Maluku province. We have also another famous sea, Arafura Sea, which is famous for its fisheries potential. Uh, Victor has mentioned that uh, with fisheries potential around 4.66 million uh, ton per year, we support around 30 to 60 percent of all Indonesian uh, fisheries uh, production. Now, not only coral reef are the important ecosystem in the ocean. We have three important ecosystem in the ocean. The coral reef, mangrove, and the seagrass. And Maluku have all of them. And we have quite big coral reef and uh, mangrove uh, ecosystem, which is both almost one point, around 1.3 kilometers square, and uh, seagrass around 393 uh, kilometers square. These ecosystems, supports hundreds of thousands of species, which make Maluku become center of mega biodiversity. Now, I have to remind everyone that biodiversity has important economic value. First, for food resources, we have uh, different kind of uh, fish and uh, shrimp and everything. And it's also important for industry, for tourism. And the last one, it also very important for biomedical research. This is the coral reef are home to thousands of species. They may be developed in pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals to maintain human health and to treat and cure disease. So, just a second, we have a technical problem. Okay, I'll continue. So, the last economical value of uh, biodiversity, which is our treasure that hasn't been explored or utilized is the biomedical or pharmaceutical potential where we can harvest bioactive compounds that can be used in pharmaceutical of other industries. We can do this by a process so-called bioprospecting. So what is bioprospecting? Bioprospecting theoretically known as biodiversity prospecting is the exploration of biological material for commercially valuable genetics and biochemical properties. In simple terms, this means that 
investigation of living things to see how they can be commercially useful for humans. So we can screen all these hundreds of thousand species that we have to find bioactive compounds that can be used in industry, either pharmaceutical or other industries. This potential has very big uh, economical value that if we develop, can reduce the pressure to the fisheries or other uh, pressure to the ocean. Beside the fish, we also have other uh, species or organ marine organisms that potentially can be harvested as a, uh, the source of uh, medical, like sponges and soft corals. We have also uh, nudibranchs and other organisms that can be used for such purposes. Now, the problem with developing uh, bioprospecting is we have first know what we have. This is what we lack. We don't even have the database of the biodiversity in Maluku or in Indonesia. How many species we have and how many we lose every year. This is why we need a comp comprehensive and a very intense collaboration in research to start building database on marine biodiversity. Now, examples of bioprospecting that has been famously known, for example, the, I know everybody must have heard about PCR. Since COVID, everybody has undergo PCR. For your information, the enzyme used in PCR reaction is the enzyme that extracted from bacteria that found in hot spring. So the enzyme from this bacteria can hold or withstand a very high degree of temperature. We, our enzyme, can only withstand temperature up to 37 degrees. But in the PCR process, we need temperature up to 95 degrees. And only the enzyme from specific organisms, so-called extremophiles, like organism from hot springs, can be used as enzyme to be used in the, uh, this process that need a very high uh, temperature. There's another, uh, there's many, many examples about this. And this is what we need to extract from our ocean. This is the estimation of pharmaceutical value that has been extracted from the sea and has been commercialized so far. Have you, I will not uh, read one by one, but you can see that in average, every single substance or compound that become drug will uh, have value of billions of dollars. It's not rupees, but dollars. So if the fisheries have a value of billion of dollars, then pharmaceutical potential of marine organism is probably the same or more. We need to really focus on this. So it is estimated that we can still find up to 500 to 600,000 bioactive product with estimated value from 500 to 5 trillion US dollars. This is really, really high. And we have more potential because if we have more diversity, we have more chance to get bioactive compound from our biodiversity, high biodiversity. So now we have problem. First, we don't know what we have because we lack of taxonomies, we lack of bioinformatics, we lack of bio, uh, molecular biologists, 
biochemists, human resources, and we lack of investment, which resulted in lack of facilities to develop this. And the last one, there's unclear regulation, how can we develop this? There is a, <clears throat> uh, I think there is a, a protocol, Nagoya protocol, that uh, said if we commercialize any natural resources, we have to give, give back uh, some proportion to the community, back to the community, back to the ecosystem. But it is really unclear in Indonesia how this implemented. And I think there is no rule about this yet. Or there is no law about this yet. Another problem is the time. From the screening up to commercialize or up to the time we can distribute all the uh, medicine to the world, it takes about 15 years. So 6.5 six years for screening and around seven years for clinical trials, 1.5 years for FDA review, and then we can release it and sell it to the whole world. So to shorten this time, Patimura University have been working together with Karolinska Institute to develop some innovation where we hope we can reduce the time of screening from six to six point five years to around two years. We cannot really push to shorten the clinical trial time or the time FDA used to review, but we can surely shorten the time for the screening. So basically, we try to uh, make an innovation that can shorten the time to produce the drug that we can, we can, we can uh, use for human welfare. So as I mentioned before, all this effort will need collaboration from all stakeholders. Nowadays, UNPATI have several ongoing collaboration with IRD friends, especially for DNA barcoding uh, for fish and Kagoshima University for marine biodiversity, Leeds and Essex University for eDNA, Aberdeen for Sprung's microbiome, Karolinska Institute for bioprospecting, Hawaii University for fisheries biology, and Southern Cross University for coral reef and marine debris. We also have collaboration with uh, several national university like Brin, UNHAS, UGM, and others. And we hope that other university and institution internationally or nationally would like to join force to conserve our biodiversity and also to utilize the biodiversity in sustainable way for the welfare of human being. So some of uh, opportunities for research collaboration that I can think of is the first to build the database for marine organism in Maluku because we really don't have it and we lack of, of taxonomies. So probably DNA barcoding is the way to do that. So we need to do this to provide reference for the next level technology, so-called next generation sequencing or environmental DNA that can, we can use to monitoring to monitor the biodiversity in our region. So we also need a collaboration from all stakeholders in marine biodiversity conservation, and also for screening for potential bioactive compound. And finally, if possible, we have to be able to do the bench to bed drug discovery, which is we comprehensively made project from bench to bedside, from screening and to process it until we can deliver it as a drug to cure human being. 
I think that's all from me. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Limon, for valuable presentation. We now have 20 minutes for question and answer session. And I try to read the question on the chat box. There is one question from Chilun Jakiman. Uh, thank you for your great presentation, Pak Victor. I have question regarding on your presentation. What is the possible effective way could be taken by NGOs or government to bridging the gap between science and society, particularly in, in Maluku? Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is a very good question. Thank you, Chilun, for, for asking this question. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, in addition to, to bridging the gap, uh, the things that we should do also is narrowing the gap. So how to, to not, only, not only bridging the gap, but narrowing the gap. And the last thing is the filling up the gap. So normally when you're facing or countering problem where there's a gaps between, between two polars and what you should do is uh, not, not necessarily bridging the gap. Bridging the gap is okay, but uh, filling up the gap and, and narrowing the gap is uh, the things that we can do. Uh, to reconcile those two those two uh, problems or those two uh, points, and uh, in terms of uh, NGO, how NGO can participate in uh, narrowing the gap, uh, scientific gap between between uh, science and and society is, uh, I think uh, NGO should work with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, with the government with the uh, with the uh, uh, formal uh, entities. Uh, uh, to implement programs uh, that uh, that belongs to to uh, every every formal entity, so NGO can work by themselves, but they should work with the uh, with the uh, with the partners or collaborator as the partner or collaborator in order to to implement and in order to manifest uh, uh, the program. Uh, owned by by formal entity like government, university, uh, you know, uh, uh, NGO should work with them. NGO cannot work uh, uh, just to succeed or just to uh, undertake their own program, but they should work. They should they should twist their program in a way that uh, their program can be adapted. But on the other way, uh, they should adapt government program uh, uh, and and work in order to manifest the, the government program. So uh, that one thing. The second thing, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the the entities, the formal entity, like like here in the university or or the government, should also uh, accept accept uh, NGO as a as a part of the of the civil society. Uh, it is very important because uh, there are uh, prejudice and you know uh, things like. Uh, 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 idea in the government that the NGO NGO are not are not are not are not contributors uh, for their program and you you will find it you know commonly in Indonesia uh, there are there are uh, such kind of thinking uh, but basically there are many NGO that are ready to work with the government and their only program is is basically to implement government program another thing is respect respect uh, what we call community science community science or citizen citizen science program there are many things that have been that have been uh, uh, developed or that have been initiated by by the community by by the people that are not understood by 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 formal entity like like government program a very simple thing is a uh, customary or uh, customary or uh, indigenous knowledge that have you know been practiced uh, from generation to generation since long time ago and they are exist in the uh, on the field there exist that so far have been have been have been not so seriously uh, 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 getting the serious attention from the from the government so government should 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 have a program to to uphold uh, those kind of signs and uh, basically uh, uh, NGO are the uh, 
uh, entity or the or the or the organization that are working with the community and you know uh, community uh, uh, idea aspiration uh, objective of the community can be brought by by the NGO uh, in order to meet the the, the uh, government program. That basically the idea uh, uh, how to narrowing the gap or filling up the gap or bridging the gap between uh, community and science. Of course, uh, there are many science that we call modern science, but there are also a lot of science that are based on the traditional practices that have been existed for a long time, proven for a long time, and, and that cannot be uh, you know, put away. We should consider those kind of science in addition to the formal science that uh, we develop in the formal institution. That's uh, my answer, and thank you for that great question. Thank you, Dr. Nikiulu. We have now three questions from Dr. Jati Nugroho, SHM Home, from SCIH JS Lumajang. The, the first question is, what is the strategy of each country regarding the sea to be preserved and the welfare of the people considering Indonesia is rich in marine resources, but for the welfare of the fishing community, it is still less prosperous. I think we start with first question. This question was delivered to both of you. Who would like to answer first? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what is the strategy uh, for each country? I think, uh, example, what we've seen in Maluku, we have a huge fisheries potential, but we are number four, the poorest province in Indonesia. The problem is the fishermen, uh, artisanal fishermen, do not have access to the market. And some surveys have shown that the artisanal fishermen was not supported with infrastructure, uh, tools, and uh, cold chain supply to the market. This is probably the main problem uh, as one example in Maluku. I think this is the probably more expertise of uh, but Victor and I will have him to continue and answer the questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bagino. Uh, can I can I take uh, the question second two question? What is the legal model yeah. for the state for the preservation and welfare of the ideal society? Yeah, uh, the generic the generic uh, name for the for the preservation uh, or conservation uh, ecosystem conservation or preservation is. A protected area. So uh, uh, in marine, we call it marine protected area. In the terrestrial, we call it terrestrial protected area. So the, the approach that, uh, that uh, are used by the government right now is the habitat protection or ecosystem protection, this protection. So those two are, are and basically there are three. The third one is a day in a or a day in a protection. You know, uh, uh, normally uh, the day in a protection are, are you know, uh, developed so fast in, the, in other country, but not yet in Indonesia. And uh, uh, marine protected area, as we discussed since uh, this morning, uh, is, uh, as I said, generic name. Generic name for protection or conservation program in Indonesia is uh, 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 marine protected area. But basically, uh, government have developed uh, regulation that are uh, become the basis for the for the uh, conservation activity, and it's not necessarily a protected area. It can be uh, like a park, you know, marine park is another thing. Uh, another thing is we call it a reserve area. Uh, uh, that 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 are several terminology used by the government, but the generic name is the protected uh, protected area. And uh, uh, in addition, as I mentioned before, in addition to the formal protected area. There's also a, a community-based protected area. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, practice of conservation that have been, that have been, that have been uh, carried out by the, by the people for a long time. 
uh, for instance, in, in here in Maluku, we have a, a village-based uh, protection or management, resource management called SASI. That's basically traditional one. It is not the government uh, uh, initiated, but it is traditional or community-based initi initiative uh, program. So uh, that's the legal, the legal model. We have legal model, but we have a community-based model. These are not covered yet by, 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 the, by the legal system that we have. Of course, in some area in, in Maluku, uh, uh, you know, government has paid respect on those traditional one and how those traditional can be, can be brought up and you know, can, be, can be under the umbrella of the legal, of the legal system. But basically, that's uh, we found in all over Indonesia how those traditional system exist, and uh, uh, you know, uh, gradually government have have uh, developed a program to also uh, include those ill well, not illegal but uh, those traditional traditional system. Uh, the question number two: or How to create MPA that support the sea? Uh, uh, you know, uh, the process of creating MPA uh, it's starting from the there are two approaches top down approach and bottom up approach the top down approach is the is the an mpa which is created by the government through the through the political high political decision and once it is it is established uh, the mpa is is uh, socialized and familiarized to the to the to the people and you know automatically consequently the people should accept what have been have been decided by the by the top level it is like top down approach but the more efficient one, more effectively managed protected area is the bottom-up approach. The bottom-up approach is started with 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 uh, idea from the from the people. If it, we, are, we are talking about the village or the at the rural area, then they start with the rural community. And once they have decided that they want to develop uh, uh, an MPA or protected area, and they brought they, they bring it to the to the to the uh, province level. And even the governor, the governor will, will, will designate the area and the governor will submit it to the, to the national level. And let, lastly, it will be decided by, formally decided by the, by the uh, central government. So that's, uh, uh, we call it bottom up, uh, uh, bottom up level, uh, bottom up process. And normally the bottom up process is more successful in, in its implementation than the top down approach. So that's basically the way to create a protected area in Indonesia. I think not only marine, but also a terrestrial protected area, even even also um, uh, uh, spaces uh, based uh, protection uh, scheme. So it is developed better to develop by community, uh, building the awareness in the community, and uh, get their aspiration. And once they decided, and that idea to be brought by uh, to the higher level and uh, uh, formalized uh, by, by the, the existing uh, system or regulation at the higher level. That's basically the approach. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nikhil. And we, we now move to the, the interactive session and we have two speakers to, uh, I mean, two participants to ask the question. We start with, Ibu Dia Datis, Dr. Dia Datis from Patimura University. Please, you can deliver your question. Thank you for uh, Ibu Vilma as the moderator. And uh, Pak Victor Nikiolo, it is nice to meet you here today, Pak, because uh, I use one of your book, Blue Water Crime, as my one of my literature when I uh, conduct my thesis and my dissertation. So, <laughs> so now you are um, give. Uh, talking about blue hello approach. Uh, I want to know the strength of this approach compared to other approach, because uh, from what, uh, what I knew that in Maluku, we already have a lot of approach in terms to 
honoring the marine environment and also to how to give uh, community welfare, welfare. So what is the strength of this uh, approach compared to other previous approach? And is it able to conduct here? Because we know that um, if you are talking about uh, sea law and other regulation in Indonesia, there's a, a complex regulation. So my question is, is it able to conduct here, especially in, in Maluku, uh, in terms of uh, government support and gov uh, local uh, regulation? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Budia, for the uh, great question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for using my book. I authored that book like, like, yeah, I think 10 years ago or 15, almost, almost 15 years ago. The, the title of the book is Blue Water Crime. Before everyone in Indonesia is talking about, about uh, I, IU fishing, I have written uh, that book, <laughs> introduced the idea of, of how to combat with the IU fishing in Indonesia. Okay. Um, uh, uh, what is the strength of the blue halo? Uh, you know, uh, blue halo is developed by by the consideration that uh, so far we have a segmented policy. We have uh, an integrated policy between uh, uh, fishing, uh, uh, fishery stock, fish stock, yeah, commercial fish stock, and the protected area. And the consequence of that, one of the consequence, of course, there are many, there are many aspects, there are many driver of that, of, of that uh, 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 overexploited fishing. But one of the of the problem is because uh, there is no relationship between protected area and in this case, I, I, I in, in in Maluku case, I mentioned about 14 million hectare uh, area, and uh, with the with the almost 100 million hectare uh, fishing ground. That's basically there is this disconnectivity between those two. And blue halo strength is to develop a system by which uh, those those two aspects, the fish stock and the, and the protected area or conservation activity, conservation pro program can be blended, uh, can be united. So we hope that by that system, uh, the management effectiveness of those two resources can be, can be improved. And another strength is uh, uh, we are not only talking about the biological aspect of the, of the system, but also economic aspect. So we hope that the, the return, economic return derived from, from fishing can be partly uh, 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 plow back or can be partly reinvested into the conservation program, conservation area. So there is a, a responsibility of the players in the, in the fishing industry to set apart uh, their income or their profit to care about, to take care about the, about the environment. That's basically the idea, uh, but it is very small amount. You know, uh, just relying on the profit derived from, from fishing is very small amount. Uh, it is like less than 5% if you want to uh, finance uh, a con the whole conservation activity. So we use that amount as a, as a we call it as a, as a trigger to develop uh, the bigger function of sustainable uh, financing system. So use that one because people all over the world just look at our area here in Indonesia, especially in Maluku. If there is an intention of the government, of the community to uh, to have that kind of uh, such kind of uh, system or have in mind that kind of system and they are ready to, to participate. So basically uh, the strength of the Blue Halo program is not only biological aspect, that's very important one, but it's not only biological aspect, but also financial aspect. So what we want to develop is sustainable financing system, even we call it innovative financial system where money can come from many sources and money are pulled up here in, 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 the, in, in this region, in this country to manage uh, the entire activity. And the last thing is about the livelihood. Of course, we mentioned before, we discussed before about the, about the impact of the uh, development program to the, to the livelihood, to the, to the livelihood uh, of the people, well-being of the people. 
and we found out that we are still like like the one that we have right now. So uh, we hope that by by that system we can create uh, other alternative uh, employment. We can develop uh, what we call uh, 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 best product that can be sold in the international market. So basically, that's the idea. It is a comprehensive idea. And your second question about how we could develop that, how with the with the with the situation that we are facing right now in in this country, especially in Maluku. I think it takes time. You know, we will we will we will work uh, uh, gradually. We will we will communicate the idea with the government at the higher level, at the central government. It is accepted, but how those idea can be accepted at the at the at the local at the provincial level? And I think it takes time. Not only government, stakeholders. Stakeholders are very important here in Maluku. Not only in Maluku, everywhere. Stakeholders are uh, youth, girls, women. Uh, you know, fishermen. Uh, Raja Raja, uh, they are all very important here in Maluku. So we should communicate the idea. But the idea, uh, once it is accepted at the national level, we hope that we can we can develop it in in Maluku. And let me tell you guys, uh, it will start tomorrow. Tomorrow, the rector will launch uh, 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 a first survey on on Blue Hollow, and it will be launched tomorrow afternoon uh, here here in in Unpati. And the team consists of uh, University of Patimura, from Brin, Badan Research, uh, and from uh, Conservation Indonesia. They will start uh, for the first trip. It will be it will be a 14 days survey in Banda, uh, in Banda NK, and the second trip will be another uh, 15 days survey in 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 uh, Utara Seram, in North Seram. So that's basically uh, the the things that we started in Maluku and. You know, Maluku should be happy. Maluku should accept that. Why? Because it is the pro national program that will be started, implemented in Maluku. So Maluku is has a privilege to 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 have that program. It will be piloted in here in Maluku. So uh, again, it takes time. We will start with the basic data, scientific data, and once survey has uh, 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 been conducted, we will we will use those survey data, result of those survey to communicate with the government. And to develop more concrete program for this problem. Thank you, Dr. Niki Yulu, for very insight explanation. And we have one interactive session for one speaker. Uh, there is Siska Sokomena. Ms. Siska, time is yours, please. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Latini, again for the chance to allow me to speak. Um, uh, uh, previously in Dr. Nikiolos' presentation, I see that there were many upcoming projects, uh, plannings to teach the people to maintain marine life. But then I see in uh, Dr. Limens' uh, presentation, I see that Maluku was in the heart of the coral reef triangle. So the biodiversity that we have is amazing in numbers. So basically, I would assume that we're going to need more work in maintaining that marine life. So my question is, uh, what are the most important skills that should be taught to the citizens right now to improve and even maintain the biodiversity that we have with the tools that we have right now? Uh, that's my question. Thank you so much. Uh, if I got the question correct, what's the most important thing to teach the student or the people? The people, the skill? sir. The, the, to teach the people about the skills. Uh, oh, the skills. Team. Yes, sir. OK. Uh, difficult question. People, I'm teaching the student, but I'm not teaching the people. Uh, for conserving biodiversity, I think people need to appreciate, to love the ocean and know the value of the biodiversity. And the skills that has to be teached to the people is probably how to conserve how to take care of their own environment, whether uh, local environment 
or just around stop with the with around the house and then if you walking by the ocean probably try not to throw uh, garbage everywhere plastic or if you see something like that you can collect it or you can join the uh, many uh, groups that already uh, I think start to uh, collect uh, plastic debris and stuff, but really to teach a special skill to the people, it's a challenge because everybody will need uh, different, everybody will have different opinion. It's not like the student that we can teach a set of skills that can be used for scientific purposes. This is not for scientific purposes, so it's kind of tricky. Uh, can you add for it? Uh, Siska, that's, that's a very good question. Let me, let me add, Pagino has, has, has uh, replied. Uh, you know, uh, I think Pagino alluded about, about uh, taxonomies. And I say that taxonomies is the very, very important skill set that we, will see, that we should have. Not only in Maluku, but you know, in Indonesia. And it is not, uh, what do you call it? It is not uh, easy profit generating uh, profession. You know, if you, if you have a, a, a profession as a taxonomist, you should stay uh, very lonely in a laboratory. You, you go to the field, taking the sample. And it's unlike it, it's unlike the other profession that uh, you know dealing with many people. So it's not a favorite one, but I said it is very very important. As a taxonomist, is very important. And the last thing that I should I still tell to everyone, taxonomist is the first profession in the world. When God created universe and He said to the Adam, and Adam is the one biologist. Is the first biologist and taxonomist in the world is Adam. Because Adam determined and uh, put the name to everything in the world at the time, you know. So taxonomy is very important. Let, let, let me encourage everyone, students, if you are in the taxonomy field right now, continue, you know, persistently doing that. It's very, very important. It's very important to be the taxonomist. And we are losing a lot of spaces because there are no taxonomists, not only here in, Bog in, 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 Bog in, in Ambon. In my place in Bogor, it is the similar thing. There are so many taxonomies. So that's the, the very important skill set that we, that we should have. That's my addition to Fiska. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. It's, it's not easy, but it is needed. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we still have two questions, I think. One question from Hattie Siwabesi. What does the Maritime and Marine Science Center of Excellence do to collaborate with the government of Maluku province investors in doing blue colors concept in Maluku in order to increase economic growth of local fishermen in Maluku? And the second question from Mrs. Mrs. Fancy to Pa Victor, do you think about the development strategy policy based on the reconciliation of potential social capital and in the potential of coastal marine. Yeah. Firstly, I would like to invite Pagino to answer the first question. Yeah. Uh, actually, like uh, Victor just explained, uh, yes, Southern Conservancy Indonesia just start the collaboration with Patimura University and we will do the kickstart of Blue Hollow Survey tomorrow uh, when we survey WPP714 for uh, genetic or biological and ecological connectivity and also for Basically, to scientifically prove that MPA has contribution to the fishing ground. Of course, like Pavlikov said, this will be the first step from the whole 
huge full hollow program that have so many steps and so complicated and probably need collaboration from all stakeholders, especially from uh, Maluku gov uh, province government. So this nice big program can be successful. So in terms of investment and others, it will be the next step, but we will launch the first step tomorrow and we got the privilege to be the first in Indonesia to start this Blue Halo program. I think uh, that's from me. The rest from Blue Halo probably perfect. Would like to add. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I think I can take the question from Fancy. What Pagino explained is, is I think it's it is completed. Uh, so I can can I can yeah. take the yeah. uh, question of Fancy. Yeah, Fancy. Thank you so much. Um, social capital is, is very important. Social capital should be taken into account seriously in every program and activity. And for our case in Maluku, we have a lot huge social capital. And especially if we are, we are talking about the resource management. And those social capital should be, should be, should be seriously you know, uh, 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 considered by, the, by the anyone by the government, by NGO, when you are developing uh, like the system that will involve them. Uh, social, capital, uh, social capital is your network. Uh, your, how do you, you engage with others is your social capital. So uh, I think uh, people of Maluku, government of Maluku should have a, a open, open mind uh, habit, you know, uh, in a way that you should communicate with everyone in order to improve your social capital. So social capital, uh, the question is how, so, uh, uh, to what extent social capital should be, should, be, should be taken into consideration. I should say it is a must. We should consider social capital uh, and identify social capital in every community and use if, even in every person and use the social capital in, in developing this program. For the Blue Halo program, we will, we will, take, it, uh, so we will take the social capital into, into uh, our process, and of course, we will uh, communicate, uh, building the communication with the uh, with the leaders, with the local leaders, with the uh, even at the community leaders, uh, religious leader. You know, uh, develop uh, things of uh, like that. Yeah, communication with them, uh, taking their capital. You know, as a part of the of the program. So, in, in short, I should say, uh, fancy that social capital is important and. Uh, in this case, in our country, in our province, we should we should seriously uh, have have that in our in every program, every and each program. Thank you, Dr. Nikhil. And probably this is the last question. I have one question to Pagino. I'm curious to know: Could we run the monetizing biodiversity of the sea together with MPA at the same area and at the same at the same time? As we know, for monetizing, we produce a product from the biodiversity of the sea. And on the other hand, we conserve the area and preserve the area on the MPA's program. That's my question. OK, thank you very much. Very nice question. And this is exactly what I failed to mention before. So actually, when we conserve the marine area. We also conserve the biodiversity. And if we use the marine resources for fisheries, we need to take a lot because we need to fulfill the protein for many, many people. But the advantage of bioprospecting is it's very environmental friendly. For example, you need only like one centimeter square or each organism to be taken and get extract and screen it to get bioactive compound. If you can identify this bioactive compound, you can then synthesize it or you can culture the organism to make more extract. So the pressure to the ecosystem 
to the organism is very, very low compared to the fisheries. So this is in the future will be the way to utilize marine resources, utilize our biodiversity for the welfare of the people because the potential is trillions uh, US dollar. That's huge. It can even support the whole country. We just need to be seriously invest and research on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rimor. Well, audience, uh, I think we have reached the time allocated for this panel, panel two, before I end it. Let us express our gratitude to the keynote speakers, Dr. Victor Nikulu from Conservation International Foundation, Dr. <laughs> Limon, MSc, Chairman of Maritime and Marine Science Center of Excellence, Patimura University. Hopefully, the material presented today can be a reference for researchers related to important issue that exists in the realm of scientific development in Patimura University. As our appreciation for the two finished speakers, we present the following set This certificate is given to Dr. Victor Nikiulu as a speaker in the international webinar, the 15th in DS Natalis Patimura University, Ambon, Maluku, Indonesia. And this certificate is, is also to give is, is also given to Dr. Renat Dino Felimon MSc as a speaker in the international webinar, the 15th in DS Natalis Patimura University. Ambon Maluku. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you to both of you. We give a round of applause to the speakers on this panel. And we wish you both a very nice day and see you again on another event. Next, I return to this, uh, I return this event to the Master of Ceremony. Good afternoon and thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wilma. Distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, please click on the link provided by the committee in the chat box in order to obtain your certificate and speaker's presentation materials. Please make sure your information is correct, especially your name and email address. We hope you are enjoying the webinar. We've had inspiring time together. Unfortunately, we have come to the closing ceremony. For this agenda, we would like to invite the host of the webinar, the committee chairman, Dr. Juan Rico A.S. Titahelu SHMH, to deliver his speech. Dr. Juan Rico, the screen is yours. Thank you, every. Thank you for Master of Ceremony, Ibu Dewi Supriyadi. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. Good yes, afternoon, absolutely, everyone. Sir. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. The Honorable Rector of the Patimura University, Professor Dr. M.G. Sapten, OSIM Hum, for my respect, Professor Freddy Lewakabisi, MPD, the speakers, Professor Ben Harpen, PhD, Sarah Hamid, PhD, Dr. Erna Gino Limon, MSG, Dr. Victor Nikiulu, and moderator, Ibu Will Malatuni, PhD. So, Master of Ceremony, Ibu Dewi Supriyadi, and interpreter, Ibu Vera and Ibu Sharon from the Embassy of the United States, as well as the participant of the international webinar that I'm proud of. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Shalom. Om swastiastu, namo buddhaya, salam kebajikan. First of all, I apologize professionally representing the committee of the 15th anniversary because of technical constraints so that there are, that there are many participants who can not join in this webinar. 
This webinar is part of the 15th anniversary of Patimura University. I would like to thank the rector and his staff, the great resource person who have provided knowledge related to the environmental conservation, especially the marine environment where our global issues are focused on the ocean and its preservation of for the future future of the next generation. I hope this activity cannot continue by sharing issue related to law, marine and coastal environment in the form of webinar where we can conduct anytime and anywhere with experts in any part in the world. I and the committee would like to thank the Embassy of the United States in Indonesia, which has helped a lot of the pre preparation process, coordinate with each other regarding the speakers until the activity were carried out today. I hope that this relationship will not only come to this activity, but also to other activities involving the American Embassy and the other embassies in Indonesia. Finally, I will close with a poem. Makan sore dengan ketan sambil duduk di bawah pohon jati. Kalau ada kesalahan dalam ucapan, mohon tidak dimasukkan hati. Siang-siang ditanyai istri, sudah makan apa belum? Usai sudah pertemuan hari ini. Sekian dan wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Shalom, om santi santi om. Nama budaya, salam kebajikan. Terima kasih. Shalom. Thank you, Dr. Joan Rico A.S. Tahelu S.H.M.H. Ladies and gentlemen, and now, to end the day, I would leave you with a quote by Stewart Brand, an author, an innovative thinker who once said, We can see the past but not influence it. We can influence the future but not see it. Let us all be guided by the all things we have learned and heard throughout the conference today and be able to see and influence our future. Thank you very much for your attendance and participation. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon.